I want to see a legacy of faith in my family that passes down the I dream of having a place that I can fill with friends, family, love. I have a dream of opening and running my own coffee shop. That my shop. children would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I want to see my boys grow up to love God and love people well. I want well. to dive underwater and kill sharks. I dream of the day I get the joy of walking my daughter down the aisle on her I wedding day. I dream of owning a house one day. I want to see my kids come to know Jesus and be able to I baptize them. I would love to see myself be the next J.K. Rowling. All right, good morning, Vintage Church. So excited and thankful to be here with you this morning. Let's give it up for Pastor Rob for just doing such an awesome job just leading us. And for the band this morning doing just an awesome job leading us in praise and worship. Um, we are going to be diving into God's Word today. It's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Our wonderful Connect team can come down and raise your hand. Take this home with you. We believe there's nothing better that you can do then take God's word home, read it, let it transform your life. Um, while you're turning to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, I also want to thank God for the rest of the pastors and just the staff and just the volunteers. Let's give it up for just our church family as a whole, just for being strong and continuing to push back darkness for Jesus. So uh, let's begin reading at verse 1. It says, I now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Let us pray. Um, God, just thank you so much just for the opportunity this morning to bring forth your word, God. I pray that I would decrease as you increase. I pray that we would just open up our hearts to what your word has to say this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, how many people like to go sailing in the building? A few people? Sailing on the water. Okay. I don't, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> you may or may not have heard, but about three weeks ago, I went sailing with Layton, my V group leader. And uh, it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. We had some crawfish from Deanies. Anybody eat crawfish from Deanies in a building? Yes, the best crawfish in New Orleans. No, no one else could compare. So we, we go sailing. The, the wind is blowing. The sun is shining. We're eating crawfish. I mean, this is a, it's like incredible, like a scene from a movie. And whenever something in life is that beautiful, you have to put it on social media, right? Like, it's, if, if it's, like, you have to, you have to take a picture, you have to get some likes, you have to get some comments, you know, so, you know, I'm out there, I'm in my trunks, you know, I've been working out, you know, so I'm like, this might help my chances of finding a wife, you know, so I'm like, yeah, let's put something on social media, so we thought about putting it on Facebook, but y'all like Facebook, anybody likes Facebook in a building? I, I, I like Facebook, however, since my aunts and uncles and Friends, grandparents are now on Facebook. <laughs> I like to spend my time on Instagram or Snapchat or InstaSnap, InstaStory. So anyway, there's something on Instagram called a boomerang. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. We had to educate Pastor Dustin on a boomerang. Uh, there's, a, there's a feature called boomerang. So we're out there and we decide, okay, once the sailboat slows down, we're going to get a boomerang of me and another guy jumping off into the water to, like, put on social media. So the goal is we're going to jump off, then we'll swim back and get on the boat. So the wind slows down. We decide. We jump off. We get in the water. We come up. My mind is on the boomerang. So I'm like, did you get the boomerang? He's like, what? I'm like, did you get the boomerang? He's like, yeah, I got it. I got it. Meanwhile, the sailboat is drifting away. <laughs> I'm worried about the boomerang. The sailboat is leaving me behind, me and another guy. So then they're like, what are y'all doing? Swim. So we start trying to swim. And I mean, t I'm telling you, the wind just picked up. We could not catch the sailboat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're sitting there in the middle of Lake Pontchartrain, And we're just like thinking, OK, they're, gonna, they're like, don't worry. We're going to come back. We're going to turn around and come get you. So we're like, OK, so we're sitting there treading. Now, I haven't swam in over a year, so I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like try, try, trying to stay above the water. 
And we're sitting there, and lo and behold, the boat just gets further and further and further away. And you never believe what happened. The motor, the engine had stopped working. They couldn't get it to start, to turn around and come get us. So the first thought I'm thinking is, I hope this lake doesn't have sharks in it. Because I hear sharks like dark meat. I'm not trying to get eaten alive. The other guy was white. I was black. I'm not trying to go out like that. So I'm sitting there with treading the water. The next thought is like, I'm going to die a virgin. This is bad. My third thought is like, my poor mama is going to turn on the news and see my picture. And I'm sitting there and I'm treading. And it had to be about, I feel like it was an hour. They say it was only like 10 minutes. <laughs> Well, we're treading, and finally, in the distance, we see the sailboat turning around. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Sailboat comes, and it's a rescue mission, and we survive. Okay, we survive. So while I was in the water, I had no idea what was going to happen. I, I, I had a fear of the unknown. I didn't know what to expect because literally we were in the middle of Lake Pontchartrain. So this sailboat did not turn around. I was really going to die. Like, seriously. <laughs> so we're just sitting there. I didn't know what to think. And I had to make a decision. I had to decide whether or not I was going to choose this faith that it's going to somehow come back and get me and keep treading despite my arms feeling like Squidward, you know, just trying to stay above the water. Or if I would choose fear, freak out, and drown. I had to make a decision. And in our text right now, we're going to read an amazing story of Abraham. So in the text, he's called Abram. Abram means high father. And if you read a little further in Genesis to Genesis 17, he gets called Abraham. God changes his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. So Abraham, this is an amazing biblical story of how God pursues Abraham, how God calls Abraham, and Abraham has to make a decision whether or not he would choose faith and walk into the things that God called him to do, or if he would allow the fear of the unknown to stop him from walking into that promise that God had called him to do. And the truth of the matter is, everyone in this room, I feel that, and I believe firmly that God has called all of us to walk into the things that he's placed on your life for his kingdom and his glory. I believe that God has called Pastor Rob and his family to Orlando to walk into the promises of God. I believe that God has called us as a church to keep pushing back darkness in the name of Jesus in this city for the glory of God. And even in your own individual life, whatever that dream is, whatever that, whatever that vision is for you that God has given you, whether it's to share the gospel, start a business, whatever that dream is that God has placed in your life, I believe he's placed that dream there and we have to make a decision how we're going to respond. Decisions. Decisions. We make decisions every day. The average adult makes 35,000 conscious decisions a day. What are we deciding to do? I want to look at this thought this morning that in order to embrace God's vision for your life, you have to surrender it all. Whatever that vision is that God has for your life, in order to embrace it fully, we have to surrender it it all. So today is Father's Day. Let's give it up for all the fathers in the building. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. And Father's Day is actually a result of someone who was sitting in a church in 1910 named Miss Sonara died, and God placed a burden on her heart to start a, a holiday, start an annual movement to celebrate dads. And she had to surrender what people would think. She had to surrender all these things. And now we celebrate Father's Day, over 100 years of celebrating fathers. As Pastor Dustin said earlier, to all the fathers, congratulations. You made it another year. So we celebrate fathers. Now, Abraham, if you grew up in church at all, you know that we refer to Abraham as Father Abraham. All right? 
There's a song. I'm not going to sing it. Sorry. Because Robert said I didn't make the cut last time I tried to sing. So if they don't want this talent, oh well. They're going to miss out. So we know the song, Father Abraham has many songs. I'm one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right? So we talk about Abraham, Father Abraham. A little bit of context and information about Abraham for you. Abraham was the 10th descendant of Noah. He came from the bloodline of Shem, the 10th descendant of Noah. And, and he was born in a city called Ur. Everybody say Ur. <laughs> Sounds like some New Orleans slang. <laughs> Ur, every day. Um, anyway, <laughs> he was born in Ur, and a lot of historians like to try to debate, you know, when they're trying to think, uh, prove this idea that the Bible is inerrant, or the Bible's not inerrant. They try to prove this idea that, oh, Ur, we can't find Ur, we can't find Ur. But in 1927, archaeologists actually found Ur. So it's located in current-day southern Iraq. So, I mean, I would visit, but, you know, th things are kind of hard. I might just go to Israel instead. Um, side note, we're going to Israel next year. Sign up. Um, so, anyway, Abraham was the son of a guy named Terah. All right, he was the son of a guy named Terah, and they're living in Ur. Uh, Abraham marries Sarah, and then they have Lot that's a part of this narrative as well. Lot was Terah's grandson and Abraham's nephew. So, they're living in Ur, and Tara decides that they wanted to move to Canaan. So they, it's like a road trip. Pack everything up. We're moving. So they're going towards Canaan, and they get to a city called Haran. And when they get to Haran, Tara decides they, they wanted to stay there. He wanted to make that home. So they, 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 they unpack the bags. They move in. That's their home. So while they're there, they're living life. Tara lives to be 205 years old which is crazy. People in the Bible days just lived to be so old. Like, I want to know what was their secret. Like, was it Pilates? Was it CrossFit? Was it Whole30? Did they cut the carbs out? Like, what, what was it? Does anybody wish they could live to be like two, 300, 400 years old? Show of hands. No, I know. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking like that's a lot of games of bingo you could play, right? <laughs> the older people, I used to work with older people. They like to play bingo a lot, and they like to go to Piccadilly's, you know. You give them those two things, they'll be happy. So, so anyway, we see that they live in, in this city, Haran, and that brings us to our passage right now, Genesis 12 and 1. And it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. There's a couple things I want to pull from this text. One is that God is calling Abraham out of his country. And that speaks to this truth that in this text, we can see that God calls Abraham to leave a familiar place. He calls Abraham as Abraham to leave a familiar place. Next, we can see that, you know, from not only from your country, but from your kindred and your father's house, where he had protection, where he had security. God also calls Abraham to leave familiar places people. He calls Abraham to leave familiar people. And then as we see it to a land that I will show you, and God calls Abraham to embrace God's plan, to embrace God's plan. And in order for Abraham to do this, he has to surrender some things in his life. In order for him to embrace this vision that God has for him, he has to surrender some things in his life. And we're going to look at a couple things that he had to surrender. And possibly this morning, as God is calling us to a new place as a church, as God is calling you to a new place in your personal life, whether it's to share the gospel, whether it's to start something, whether it's to pick up something that you forgot about, that God is stirring in your heart, whatever it is, possibly... We also must have to surrender. We also must have to surrender and be willing to surrender some things. So the first thing that we can see from this text is that Abraham surrenders his comfort zone. His comfort zone. In life, we all have comfort zones, right? For some of us, it's the bed. 
you know, sleeping, watching Netflix. You know, we all have different comfort zones. And I could imagine that Abraham was pretty comfortable in Haran. I could imagine he was pretty comfortable. We know that at this time he was 75 years old, just a few years older than Pastor Robert. And, <laughs> and God calls him. I could imagine that he was very familiar with this place. He knew all the shortcuts. He knew all the back roads. He, knows, he knew which roads did not have potholes. You know, he knew that the best crawfish was at Dini's, right? He knew all these things. He knew all of this, and God is calling him out of his comfort zone. One thing to point out in this story is that God calls him. God is the hero of this story. God is the hero of the Bible. God calls Abraham. God pursues Abraham. Just like he calls us, just like he pursues us, God is the hero of this story. And a lot of people is like, oh, Father Abraham, Father Abraham. Yes, Abraham is an important biblical figure. His name is mentioned over 300 times in scripture. It's pretty serious. But God's name is mentioned over 4,000 times, so it can't even compare. God is the hero of this story. And we see this as we all think about comfort zones. The thing is, people get really attached to their comfort zones. How many people are on Team iPhone in the building? Yeah, Team iPhone. If you're not on Team iPhone, get it together. <laughs> I cannot stand sending group text messages out, and one person doesn't have the iPhone. You can't name the group. You're messing it up for all of us. Get on Team iPhone. <laughs> anyway, I've been on Team iPhone for a while, all the way back since they had, like, iPhone. I just remember my iPhone 3 in particular. And I had my iPhone 3, and I was so attached to this. I was so familiar with this. I knew how to work it. And back in the day, I don't know if they still do this or not, but you had free upgrades for certain service providers. And I was just so used to this phone, and I knew that the upgrade had upgrade had cooler things, but I was just so stuck. And that's the thing about comfort zones. We, Although we know possibly that outside of the comfort zone is something better, we just stay stuck with it. I kept my iPhone 3 after the iPhone 4 came out, after the iPhone 5 came out, <laughs> and finally, when the iPhone 6 came out, I was like, well, I didn't want to get rid of it, but it just broke. So I had to get rid of it. But we have to make sure that we don't allow our comfort zones to keep us trapped like that. Look at verse 2. It says, and I will make you a great nation and will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. You will be the blessing. As he calls Abraham to leave his comfort zone, it's just not for him to be blessed, but it's for him to bless others. And the thing about comfort zones, comfort zones, although they serve as a means to prevent us from having to experience change, we live in a world that's constantly changing anyway. Change. Change. And, and as we think about change, as we think about our comfort zones, it, just, it also includes actions in our life. Some people, I'm just comfortable going to church once a month. I'm just comfortable going to work and not sharing the gospel. I'm just comfortable not setting, a time, not setting aside time to pray. I'm just comfortable coming to church and not talking to nobody and not serving. I'm just comfortable doing what I do. Possibly God is calling you out of your comfort zone to embrace the things that he has for your life. And the ultimate example of someone stepping outside of their comfort zone is found in Jesus. He was in heaven. And he steps out of heaven and takes on flesh to live, to walk, to experience what we experience as humans and to die for us. And to conquer sin, death, and hell with his resurrection so that we might have eternal life. Talk about stepping outside of a comfort zone. And the thing about Jesus is he did this knowing 
what was the cost? He stepped outside of his comfort zone knowing that people would talk about him, knowing that he would be ridiculed, knowing that he would be betrayed by one of his best friends. Knowing that they would beat him on the back until the flesh fell off of his skin. Knowing that they would put a thorn on his head to where he was just bleeding and suffering. And they would stretch him wide on the cross. He knew all of this. Yet, he still chose to come out of his comfort zone. Because he loves us. Because he loves us. And that's the gospel. Possibly you're giving church a try. That's the gospel. Jesus loved you so much that he came and he died for your sins. And he's knocking on your heart, saying, let me in. Let me in. I love you. I have purpose for you. Let me in. Surrender. Surrender. Let me in. So we see that Abraham, as part of embracing this vision, he has to surrender his comfort zone. As a church, we're in a season where we have to surrender our comfort zone. It's comfortable knowing that Rob's going to be here. But sometimes God brings us out of our comfort zone so that we can embrace what he has next. So we see this, and we also see that he's called to surrender his past. We can see Abraham surrendering his past in this text. A lot of us can't surrender our comfort zones because we're married to the past, the way things used to be. You can go and you can study in the book of Joshua and it talks about Abraham, you know, being an idol worshiper. You know, living in a land, living in a pagan land full of all types of stuff going on. And he has to have the courage to let go of this past. Do we have the courage to let go of whatever that thing is in the past that might be preventing us from walking to the things that God has called us to do for his kingdom and his glory. If you have a kid or you are a kid, there's this movie called Frozen. And Elsa says it best. Let it go. <laughs> the cold never bothered me anyway. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> the thing is, when we're driving in a car and we see something beautiful and we just, we're just we taking in the imagery, as we keep driving, it's now in our rearview mirror. That doesn't take away the fact that it's beautiful. But if we spend all our time looking in the rearview mirror, we're going to miss the beautiful scenes that are further down the road. All right? And we're going to crash. We have to be willing to let go of the past. And this includes surrendering past relationships. Abraham had some relationships that he had to leave behind to embrace God's call for his life. One of the most important things you can do is to monitor your relationships. Who are you hanging around? Who's speaking into your life? You need friends around you that's going to talk about the things of God, that people are going to encourage you to do dream stuff, not dumb stuff. People that are going to challenge you, people that are going to push you towards the things that you need to do. You cannot allow past relationships, past comfort zones. You cannot allow the past to prevent you from doing the things that God has called you to do in your life. You have to be able to surrender it. Surrender it. And the thing is, it's hard for us to surrender because surrender in something means that there has to be change. There has to be change. And people don't like change. People don't like change. But sometimes we have to embrace change because the, 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 the things that, that God wants you to do, the person that God wants you to reach, the person that God wants you to evangelize, the person or the situation where God wants you to take a stand for something that's right requires change. We have to be willing to embrace change. So he surrenders his comfort zone. He surrenders his past. And we also see that he surrenders 
his control. He surrenders his control. He was in a controlled environment. He probably could call the shots, you know, shot caller, baller. <laughs> baller, shot caller. You know, I don't rap or sing, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> but he had to surrender that. He had to surrender control. How many of y'all know control freaks? Raise your hand. How, how many of y'all are sitting next to them? Keep your hands up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's a lot of control freaks out here, right? My way, my time, my schedule, my money, my way or the highway. And the thing about control freaks, the more things that they're controlling, the more they fear losing control. And as you think about control freaks, the thing is, I feel that most control freaks are scared of the uncertainty, right? Uncertainty. They don't mean any harm. It's just they want to make sure they're doing everything in their power to make sure that things that need to happen are in place, that they're certain. And the thing about God is that when God is in control, you can't make everything certain. Because he's in control. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Control. One of the main reasons why people have a problem with Christianity is because of control. You're telling me I can't do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it? No. Because when you give your life to Jesus, you have to surrender it all. Which means you have to submit to his control. So as you think about this, people, they, they, they want to control everything. And when they can't control everything, they get nervous. Right? They're nervous. Just shaking. Just all kind of just nervous. And, and, I mean, I get nervous as well when I get into situations where I don't know for certain what the outcome is going to be. We don't know for certain how this church is going to look in a year from now. We don't know for certain how your career or how your dream is going to look from a year from now. We don't have this certainty, but we have to remember this very important thing that Abraham realizes. He's God. We're not. Period. Period. He's God. We're not. So we have to be willing to surrender control. Let's, let's look back at, just read over Genesis 1 real quick, all the way to 3, as we look at these promises that God speaks to. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now look at these promises, he says. I will make you a great nation and will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's a couple promises here I want us to look at. One is the land promise. He, he talks about this land. I will make you a, 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 a great nation in this land. So if you read throughout the Old Testament, we can see that this land that God's talking about is canon. And this promise that God makes to Abraham comes to pass. His descendants possess the land. The next promise we see here is the national promise. You know, it would be a great nation. You, your descendants would be a great nation. And as you look later in Genesis, you'll be able to see that God speaks to Jacob, also known as Israel, and tells him, go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. And they go down to Egypt, and they're fruitful, and they're multiplying. And that's why the Pharaoh gets mad and wants to, you know, kill all the firstborns. And that's how we get into the story of Moses. God fulfills this promise of making them a great nation. And the last promise we see here is the spiritual promise that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is about Jesus. Because the reason why we could sing Father Abraham, despite you might, you might not be a Jew, you might not be a Jewish descendant, but this speaks to the fact that anybody who puts their faith in Jesus is considered a descendant of Abraham. He's not just for the Jews. He's for anybody who believes. So as we look at this story, this amazing story of Abraham, 
how he gets called, how he has to surrender all these things to embrace what God has for him. I want to give you a couple closing challenges. One is we have to hear God. You have to hear what God is saying. You have to be prayerful. You have to be in his word. You have to listen for what God is saying. Some of us, we're going through this dreamer series, and possibly you don't even know what your dream is. You don't know what God's dream is for your life, and you're, and you're walking through that. You have to be prayerful. You have to read his word. And I'll just put this out there. As we're thinking about dreams, as we're thinking about different visions that God has given to us, if your dream has nothing to do with Jesus, if your dream has nothing to do with bringing glory to God, then you should have nothing to do with that dream. Your dream, God puts us here. He gives us talents. He gives us gifts. He gives us desires, not for our gain. In this text, it doesn't say, I will bless you, period. I will bless you so you can bless others. It's bigger than you. A God-given dream is bigger than you. It doesn't end with you sitting on a pedestal. It's about bringing God glory. It's about advancing his kingdom. So as we think about that and as we're listening to God, I do understand this reality that sometimes we're praying to God and we don't hear what we want to hear. We don't hear the what. We don't hear the how. God, I'm listening. I'm praying. I'm trying to figure out, should I do this? Should I do that? And we don't hear. But one thing that you can find in Scripture and one truth that you can find about God is that you should still trust him, which is the second point. Hear God and then trust God. Will you surrender it all and trust God? With the uncertainty, with not knowing what's going to happen, whatever the situation might be in your life as a church, will we surrender it all and trust God? Are we, are we going to put our trust in God or are we going to put our trust in man? And you can't worry about what people have to say. If, if we live our lives consumed and obsessed with the compliments of other people, then we'll die off the criticism of them. If God speaks it, that settles it, it's done. But will we trust God, even if it's different, even if it looks different what God is putting on our heart to do than our current context, will we trust God? If God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. If he brings you to it, he will bring you through it. And that doesn't mean he's going to bring it through it the way you want it to be. He's going to bring it through it his way, his timing, for his glory. But we have to trust them. We have to be able to surrender it all and trust him. And then the last thing is go. Hear God, trust God, then go. You have to obey. Ludacris had a song, when you move, I move, just like that. <laughs> when God says go, you go just like that. We have to to obey. We want to know all the answers to everything before we do it, but when God says go, you go. Faith is when you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know how it's going to look, but you still go. If God says go, you better not say no. No matter how hard it is, if God puts something on you and tells you to go, you have to go. It's not easy for the Wiltons to go to Orlando, but God has spoken clearly. They dare not disobey God. And as a church, we dare not disobey God as God tells us to go. In your personal life, don't disobey God. When he says go, you do not say no. And we always have this fear, but I'm not ready. I'm not ready, God. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for that. The truth of the matter is you can never fully be ready <laughs> with anything. But one truth that I found out about God is as you go, you will grow. As you go, God will develop. God will provide. As you go, you have to 
go. I, I'm getting ready, as Pastor Rob said, I'm, I'm launching my clothing brand, Nave. Next Saturday, you're all invited. But when I started Nave, God placed this burden on my heart to do something in this industry to bring his name glory. I didn't know everything, that, how to do everything at all. But as I went, God showed me. As I went, God taught me. As you go, you will grow. This was a drastic move for Abraham. This is a story of someone who was minding their own business, living life, and God calls them to do something big. And in order to do that, he had to surrender. And this morning, I believe that as a church, as individuals, that God is calling us to surrender. He's calling us to surrender our comfort zones. He's calling us to surrender our past. He's calling us to surrender control to him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Are you willing to surrender everything for him? A lot of people say, I don't want to surrender because I don't know how it's going to look. But one thing that I know for me, I'd rather walk by faith with God than walk by sight by myself. Because if God is with me, it doesn't matter what circumstances I'm going to run into. It doesn't matter what mountains I'm going to run into. It doesn't matter what setbacks. It doesn't matter what pain. It doesn't matter what suffering. If he's with me, that's all that matters. And he is with you. He is with the Wiltons. He is with Vintage Family. But will we have faith? Will we Choose faith. Or are we going to allow fear to prevent us from walking into the things that God has called us to do? Fear. Fear. The enemy comes and he tries to put fear in our hearts. What if this happens? What if that doesn't happen? 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Are we going to surrender it all? Imagine how life will look. Imagine the great things that God can do if we just surrender our comfort zones. Imagine the people that we can reach for the kingdom if we Surrender our past and imagine the path that God will take you on if you surrender control. Are you willing to surrender it all to embrace God's vision for your life? Are you willing? Abraham was willing. Are you willing? It's, are you willing? Because if you are willing, he will be there along every step of the way. Just have to say yes. I give it to you. I surrender. You know the definition of surrender? It's to seize resistance to an opponent. To submit to their authority. Are you willing to submit to the authority of the God of the universe for your life. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much, God, for this beautiful text that shows us how you pursued and how you called Abraham, God. We take a moment to look in our own personal lives, God, as individuals and as a church, And we come, God, just saying we surrender it all. Despite not knowing what the future holds, we trust you, God. We give you our comfort zones. We give you our past. We give you total control over our lives. And we say, God, that not our will be done, but your will be done in 
our lives. We give it all to you. We won't keep being resistant to what you are doing. Whether it's in our schools, whether it's at home, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's on our job, whatever it is, that vision that you are speaking to us, God, to advance your kingdom. We pray that we will let go of everything and we will passionately pursue after it. And that we will pursue after it with faith. Believing that the best things are yet to come, God. We're sorry. We're sorry for being selfish with our comfort zones. We're sorry for letting the past, whether it's past relationships or things that we've done in the past, hold us back. We're sorry for allowing fear to prevent us from embracing the things that you have called us to do. And although we don't see the whole staircase, God, we commit to at least start walking up the steps, God. Because no matter how the staircase ends, we know that the same God that is with us to start at the walk is the same God that will be with us to the top of the staircase. So we love you, we glorify you, and we surrender it all. We submit to the authority of you and your word and your Holy Spirit in every area of our life. We lay it at your cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.